at core, blockchain makes it more stable because we know who owns what. That was my core thesis, but I don't know if it stands or not anymore. Melton, fantastic to get you back on Real Vision. It's been a while, actually. It has been a minute. So I want to go back and just cover your story first how you got into this in the first place, and then how you ended up as the queen of memes. Because I think it's a fascinating story because you're one of the most thoughtful, smartest people in the space, and you've taken one hell of a journey in this. And I, I just think people can learn from everybody else's journey. Well, thank you so much for that. I don't know that I'm the smartest. There is an interesting sort of meme, just to go back to the memes um, that we use in the space, it's the meme of the bell curve. And, you know, most of us fall somewhere on this, this bell curve. And I don't know if it's intelligence we're rating or a wide variety of factors that contribute as to how we participate in this market. So one of the things I've really been thinking about lately is, you know, most of us fall somewhere in the middle of the bell curve, you know, three standard deviations in either direction. You're getting into the long tails. That's 0.5% probability of being in those long tails. So my goal currently is to either be in the extreme right, which is giga brain, galaxy brain smart takes or in the extreme left, which is this is so not intelligent. This is such a lizard brain take and it's so dumb that it might work. And I think in crypto, the middle of the bell curve is where death happens. And in the extreme, that is where uh, you find truth. And that is also as an investor where you make your money is in the extreme I mean, I, tails of the I, bell curve. I have that bell curve meme on my screen at all times to remind me of that. I think it's the single most important thing to realize where mm -hmm. you are on that bell curve. And it's a, I think it's the key driver of success is where you are on that bell curve. Yeah, I always tell myself, don't mid-curve this. Don't <laughs> try to be too smart. Just smooth brain it. <laughs> um, okay, so my journey, again, going, going sort of with this philosophy. So I started my career in the oil and gas industry. I was down in Houston, Texas. Um, so very different from, from crypto. And I finished university during the great financial crisis. So I haven't lived through as many market cycles as you and many other sort of macro pundits who have moved over into the crypto space. I haven't seen as many cycles as you have. But certainly, I think leaving university during the, the GFC, sort of realizing, you know, you I was told all my life, all my childhood in sort of this education system I went through, if you, you know, work hard, you get good grades, you go to a good college, you get a good job then, you know, you will graduate, you will make enough money, you will buy a house, you will do all of these things that are sort of the markers of, of success, and you will have a comfortable uh, life. Not the case for my generation, right? We have gotten royally screwed in, in many regards. And so leaving during the GFC, going into the oil and gas industry, uh, that was the time that the shale revolution, if you will, had sort of started. And so my first roles in the oil and gas industry were out in Horsehead, Pennsylvania, uh, out in the back end, uh, out in, you know, West Texas. Then I went to Canada to work on tar sands oil, North Sea, Equatorial Guinea, a lot of the big LNG projects happening in Papua New Guinea, Queensland. And so I sort of had this very eclectic five years that I spent in an industry that many people in crypto would never think about. Many people in tech have never thought about, but energy really is the backbone of our, our world, the backbone of the modern economy, and also, by the way, the backbone of the digital economy, which we don't think about, because everything we do in the digital realm requires A, a semiconductor or processing chip, and B, electricity flowing through that chip or energy of some sort. And so I think we sometimes lose this connection between the physical world and our physical infrastructure and this digital world that we're now moving into. But I think uh, growing up in the oil and gas industry professionally, you know, starting on the trading side, moving into the infrastructure side, then the M&A side, and then finally corporate treasury at ExxonMobil, which by the way, when I was at ExxonMobil in 2013, 2014, Exxon was the largest company in the world with a market capitalization of $400 billion. It had credit, it had a credit rating that was as good as the US government at the time. It was still AAA, right? Today, the US government sounds like we might be getting downgraded to double A. So you think about this idea that less than a decade ago, or maybe, you know, close to a decade ago, the largest company in the world had a market cap of 400 billion. Today, the largest company in the world has a market capitalization of nearly $3 trillion. 
that is not a doubling or a trebling in a decade. That is a factor of 10x, which I think to me just highlights the power of a technology and driving exponential growth. I'd also be a very important trend, the hollowing out of companies and markets due to this trend of financialization, which I think crypto in many ways just sort of exaggerates to an, an extreme. And so um, all this oil and gas stuff, ExxonMobil, big company life. And then I went to grad school. I did what every you know 20-something year old who's disillusioned with corporate life does, go to grad school. And so I went to grad school at MIT. Like and lo and behold, Exactly. I took out I took out an educational debt for, for the first time in my life, which came back to, to bite me a bit. But I went to MIT and at MIT, um, there were a few students who were really into Bitcoin. They started the MIT Bitcoin Club is one of the few campuses where there's a lot of activity going on with Bitcoin. And at the time, it was just Bitcoin. There was no Ethereum. There was literally nothing else. Um, I had gotten into Bitcoin right before I got to, to grad school. I thought it was strange. I thought it was interesting. Um, and so I started to go on this journey. All throughout grad school, I was more interested in venture capital, startups, fintech. At that time, the first fintech boom really began in the, the venture space. And I had no idea that people my age were raising tens of millions of dollars to go and build these crazy ideas. And I was like, wait a minute, I need to be in this. This is so insane. This is so cool. I had never been exposed to that. I spent my 20s in an oil field, right, wearing fire retardant clothing and like steel-toed boots. I did not know this world existed. And so that really started my journey into the world of, of tech, into the world of startups. And then as I was leaving grad school, um, I was supposed to go back either to Exxon or to consulting. Uh, I, my grad school education had been sponsored and I decided not to do that. Um, and so I was suddenly in debt, a lot in debt for the first time in my life. So that was an interesting experience. And then um, I met Barry Silbert and Ryan Selkis, who at the time were starting this new company called Digital Currency Group. And so actually, before I even finished grad school, I started at DCG. My first day was April 20th, 2015, which marked sort of a, a turning point for me in my life. Uh, first time I took a risk, everyone was like, what are you doing? Bitcoin is for money laundering. It's for criminals. You're throwing away your life. You're throwing away your career. I made less money than I made before grad school. I was in debt. My first apartment in New York, as someone who's almost 30 years old, was 300 square feet, had rats in. It was absolutely disgusting. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so I really started to question something. But just the intellectual energy, the enthusiasm, the people I met, the, the problems people were talking about in, in crypto, just Bitcoin at that point in time, were just so interesting to me. And I just, I wanted to do something different with my life. It inspired me. It made me feel something. It made me feel purpose and, and sort of drive and motivation. And so, yeah, that, that was now uh, what, eight years ago. <laughs> and um, here we are two companies later. So three years at DCG, built that firm, 200 investments, raised money from a lot of different institutions. And really, I think, started this idea of how we build um, networks of, of companies, businesses, and sort of the importance of connectivity in this world of new technology startup. Then um, spent six months kind of poking around, went through the crazy 2017, like ICO craze, insanity, took a step back and then joined CoinShare. It's very different business, but very similar in some regards, very asset management and trading focus. There, I brought in the venture capital component, investing in and participating in early stage technology, early stage networks, and uh, have been at CoinShares now for five years. We took the company public two years ago um, on the NASDAQ Nordic. So going through that process of listing a crypto company in a foreign jurisdiction has been so fascinating, um, issuing regulated products, but then also, you know, continuing on the, the venture side. And so ah, here we are eight years later. It's been an insane uh, journey. It is nowhere close to over, but it's been wild. Hi, everyone. It's Ralph Powell, CEO and co-founder of Real Vision. I'd love you to join us over at Real Vision, where you can then experience how we can help you navigate these really complicated times. You see, investing is not an easy journey, but we bring in the world's best experts to help be your kind of advisors in navigating these times. So come to realvision.com forward slash essential and let us show how a Real Vision membership can help you. How has your thesis or your understanding changed as you've gone from being the left side of the bell curve to the middle of the bell curve to the right side of the bell curve. 
talk me through that because you will have gone through an evolution of understanding where people have gone, well, Belton, well, she's a Bitcoin, under, you know, she understands it deeply to what the fuck is she talking about? She's now posting pictures of crypt, crypto dick crypto, parts. You know, talk, talk, correct. talk me through correct. that whole <laughs> journey of your shift of thesis or broadening of thesis, let's call it. Yeah, I don't think it's been a shift, Raul. I think as you alluded to, um, I would like to say I started in the middle of the bell curve, right? I was all about payments, financial infrastructure. And I think that's still very much the case. I think what's changed for me is number one, um, developing an understanding of time scale, right? Time is a very relative thing, right? If I think about the the crypto industry, I've been in it for eight years professionally. In most industries, eight years is nothing. In crypto, that's a lifetime, right? I sometimes like to joke I'm crypto grandma, which like in no other industry would you be able to say eight years of experience makes you, you know, one of the old guard. But I think there is this sort of interesting phenomenon where um, you start to recognize that you know, many of the things we were speaking about in 2013, 2014 are still things we're speaking about because they have not yet happened, have not yet transpired. The arc of time is very long. So yes, I think an appreciation of, of time scale and just understanding, you know, the adoption of new technology. And it's not just a technology. I think it's also an adoption of just a new way of, of thinking, right? The invention and creation of computers, right? We started with computers. Then eventually, you know, we now have basically supercomputers in our pockets, we're learning as the technology evolves all sorts of new behaviors. And so I think just understanding that the time scale here, it's not five years, it's not 10 years, we're looking at decades, right? And so that was sort of number one that that sort of started to become clear to me. And the second thing I really started to understand was um, the shift in sort of culture. Culture drives everything around us and um, means drive sort of global understanding and I think starting to appreciate that crypto is 100% driven by these, these memes, right? And there's always sort of this interesting debate you have. It's like, okay, does space create time? Does time create space? This is like the question in, in physics. Um, and I think the question in crypto and just broader markets is, does narrative drive price or does price drive narrative? And so there is sort of this interesting um elements as an investor, if you look at where the returns are in crypto, there are things that when you look at them are very logical and make a lot of sense intuitively. But those, interestingly, are often not the things that are incredibly successful from an alpha generation perspective. The things that an, as an investor that have been incredibly successful, those are mid-curve things, right? And those mid-curve concepts, unfortunately, you know, in 2014, 2015, we were investing in companies at DCG that made a lot of sense intuitively, right? But those businesses were not successful because they were 10, 20 years too early. We see the same thing in just broader technology investing. We see the same thing everywhere. You can have a great idea that intuitively is correct, right? It logically makes sense, but because it is not the right moment in time, that business doesn't succeed. And so I think recognizing that where crypto is today, where this industry is today, it's way too early for some of these ideas and recognizing a lot of the things that are going to be successful in the short to medium term are things that look and feel like toys. They feel silly. Um, and that cultural element, that cultural zeitgeist is very important. Um, and more broadly, I just think we've seen, you know, crypto was the first sort of really meme-driven market. It started as a retail movement versus every other movement in finance and investing, which has been institutional and then trickles down to retail. This really started with the plebs, right? As silly people who are chronically and terminally online doing weird stuff with our friends on the internet. And it has trickled up to the institutional side. And so I think really understanding what drives price, what drives narrative in crypto is that memetic value at its core has also been sort of a key understanding. And I think challenging for me to unlearn in some ways, because my background is much more big corporate, institutional, you know, I, I studied finance, I studied math. So that part of me, you know, you have to suspend disbelief. There are no balance sheets. There are no income statements. Um, but again, the time scale of memes is, is much shorter lived than these companies are trying to build that hopefully will be around for, for decades. I mean, I, I went down this whole memetics rabbit hole after I think Sapiens probably got me down that. And then 6529 and yourself talking about this stuff made me realize the power of memetics and how it's actually everything that humans do. 
you know, humans do two yep. things. One is tell stories and one have contracts with each other over everything, right? And that's really the epicenter of what this is. And I, I started to realize that tokens in whatever format are a way of creating value around culture in ways that maybe existed more in music and fashion and things that were different because we were unable to participate in the same way. And once you unlock that, you realize how big this really is. I think of it as an intangible from a balance sheet moving to a tangible in the old traditional world. Well, I think that's one of the challenges, right, is where do tokens belong on a balance sheet? Are they an asset or a liability, right? And I think a lot of people have this view that if you create a token, you know, seemingly out of thin air, it's just purely an asset. But I do think there is an offsetting liability, right? We have to balance the, the ledger. And I think the liability is one that's difficult to conceptualize, but it's almost like a community debt, right? Um, because there's an expectation that's been created. And I think one of the interesting sort of maybe ideological things to grapple with is effectively sometimes what we're doing when we're monetizing things via tokens is we're taking future expected value, right? And selling future expected value today, right? Because the expectation is these networks will grow in utilization that will drive value. Um, these memes in the case of NFTs, right? This is my thesis on crypto dick butts. I think genitalia jokes, poop jokes, these are like the funniest jokes in, in all of history. Like I'm close to the age of 40 and in my family, we all still make, you know, juvenile jokes. It's just funny. And so even just saying, you know, crypto dick butt or just dick butt, it's, um, it's hilarious. I giggle on the inside when I say it, just like, you know, when the whole shit coin phase happened, you giggle a little bit on the inside. And so, again, I think these things that are like a little bit silly, a little bit funny, but they make people feel good. They make people laugh. Um, quite interesting. But I do think there is sort of this ideological issue where we're taking future expected value. We're monetizing it today. But what's happening in crypto is a lot of times, you know, we fail to deliver on that future expected value for a myriad of reasons. Some of them, obviously, there are a lot of bad actors. Anytime there's a new technology, you know, you have mercenaries and missionaries. There are a lot of people who are very ideologically motivated, but perhaps don't have the skills. Maybe it's not the right concept. Maybe it's not the right time. A lot of failures in execution. And then I do think, unfortunately, there are a lot of people who do not have good intentions who see this as an opportunity, right, to take advantage of this, this exuberance, uh, this irrational bubble, and to um, to monetize that in in sort of ways that that are not beneficial uh, to, to society at large. But I do think there is this um, really interesting new dynamic that's been created. But again, at the core of all of it, right, there is this underlying culture, the power of mimesis, the power of desire and wanting. And then I think there's one more trend that's sort of a, a bit more meta, um, which is this crisis of meaning that I think we're living through, especially my generation. Um, there is sort of a crisis of meaning, a crisis of identity. You know, it's interesting. I think about 10 years ago uh, when I would meet people, the first question you would ask someone is, oh, what do you do? Right. And people would speak about what country they're from, what they did as an occupation and the things that formed your identity were more tangible things like where you're from, where you grew up, what your profession was. Today, when you speak with people, right, nobody really asks that question anymore, at least not, you know, in, in my circles, or I think in my generation, when you meet someone, it's, what are you excited about? What are you interested in? Um, and so with the advent of the internet, with the advent of like this, with the advent of us being chronically online and living in this fourth space, this sort of liminal online space, there is this interesting crisis of meaning where people are asking, like, what am I about? People don't stay in one job their whole lives. People don't have one career track. We're switching, moving around. And so I think uh, people are moving around physically much more. People are changing their identity. And so I do think there is this interesting crisis of meaning. And in crypto, I think a lot of people find meaning, right? It gives them a sense of purpose. Um, which is interesting. You cannot become a Bitcoin, but I think some people are trying to quite literally become <laughs> a Bitcoin. I'm like, Bitcoin's not a personality. But I think for a lot of people, there is sort of this, this crisis of meaning, this spiritual crisis happening. And because crypto has these elements of, of philosophy in it, I think a lot of people are also attracted to cryptocurrency because it's a way to form an identity and it's a way to create meaning, um, maybe in a, in a time where people are feeling an absence of that meaning, of that connectivity, of that belonging to something that is larger than themselves. Is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. I think that trend will, will only accelerate, unfortunately or fortunately. 
And so the question is, as an investor, as a participant in culture, how do you position yourself, right, to create alpha based on on that trend, which, again, I only see accelerating? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of parts of this, I think, is one is I think there is a redefining of who we are based around where we live our lives now and our lives are lived in the internet so this digital nation state idea has much more credence than people yet understand so we identify by the groups of people we hang around with online and the similarities of ideas that we share more so than the community we live in anymore i don't really care what my neighbors do because my community is really online now and it's weird but that's how it is and so we we're i think shaping ourselves to redefine who we are and what we are, and the kind of communities we hang out in. And I think that's a really interesting cultural phenomenon that I don't think will go back in the bottle. Because as you said, we're all physically more remote and able to move around. I mean, every time I get on a video call with somebody, I'm like, where the hell are you? And they're like, everybody's in different places all the time. Like you are today, you know, and that's, that's an extraordinary thing. Because remember, when we started Real Vision, you come into our offices to shoot video and now it doesn't matter. I know that was but that was in the before times right? right um so I also I also think um you know COVID and and everything that happened subsequently um it, it created a lot of physical separation and again these there are a lot of these interesting trends that sort of start to come together but you know we're seeing a dramatic increase in what what a lot of um you know, commentators would call deaths of despair, and that is uh, deaths from uh, accidental overdose and deaths from, you know, preventable uh, diseases that are typically lifestyle related, whether that's, you know, cirrhosis, alcoholism, uh, drug addiction. And I think, again, part of that is we no longer live in, in communities, we no longer feel tethered to or anchored to, you know, these, these communities that have historically been just a central point in, in our lives. And so what this does is I think it creates a lot of uh, space and room for experimentation with new models. I think what's happening in crypto is certainly one of those. And I don't think it's just exclusive to crypto. I think one of the fundamental shortcomings of our industry sometimes is people view Bitcoin in particular, but other aspects of this as a panacea for really complex systemic challenges that we have in our present day world. One of which, by the way, is the erosion of institutional credibility at massive scale, right? I have never in my, like, I've never in my life experienced anything like this. It is incredible to see how rapidly in the last three years, we've seen the complete decimation of institutional credibility across media, across higher learning and educational institutions, across government. Like the level of distrust is incredible. And the rise of citizen journalism, the rise of independent sort of thought, the rise of uh, information dissemination through these alternative channels, through individuals, um, has just risen dramatically. And so I think there are all of these really fascinating trends that are converging, of which I think uh, crypto and just blockchains in general, public blockchain networks that allow us to have fidelity of information, whether that's financial information or other types of cultural information, is incredibly valuable. But I think it's important to recognize that these things in and of themselves are not a panacea for these challenges in our world, which are incredibly complex and also systemically driven. So excuse, excuse the barking. (laughs) That's not me. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's right. And one of the things I'm, I'm noticing here in the Cayman Islands, it's been an incredibly busy holiday season. So Americans, Canadians, everybody have been here en masse. We've had the busiest season. I think it's true across most places. And the reason I think is that in-person experiences, unique in-person experiences trade at a premium now. So even though we're generally in a recession or around a recession, where we're seeing consumer spending declining in most areas, holiday spend isn't declining. And that's, I think, a really interesting thing. And I think that's true. I think discrete in-person events, not generalized in-person events, but discrete specialized in-person events trade at a premium. Um, And so I, I think we're going through some big cultural shifts. The other huge shift, I think, is around this distrust. And, you know, we actually started Real Vision for the basis of this, seeing the financial system has lost people's trust because your generation was Occupy Wall Street, right? I saw that. And that was what got me into Bitcoin in 2013. Right. The- I mean, I think my generation is trying to survive, bro. Like, it's, 
that's my key point I'm getting to is the younger generation, the Gen Z and millennials have become risk takers in certain aspects of their lives. They're quite conservative in some, but very much risk takers in others because the cards that were dealt to them were you do your education, you get, end up with massive debt, you can't afford to invest in the stock market, you can't afford to invest in real estate, what the fuck is left? And so this new asset class emerges that's kind of more speculative by nature, that gives you the dream of riches, whether that's real or, or perceived. And that enabled a lot of people. It's the same thing as the GameStop thing. It's a rebellion and a pushback against the inability to participate in the same way that their parents did. Well, and I think that's such an important uh, driver here. I think the other component is, again, there's these very um, complex factors that I think contribute to this. But I do think the desire for belonging, the desire for uh, authentic, genuine human connection, the desire to belong to something is very important. So just kind of going back to this idea of memes, um, you know, people always ask me, like, what's up with the crypto dick butt thing? I'm like, you were a credible person. Now you're talking about this ridiculous, pixelated, you know, little cartoon. Um, why? What's happening? Okay, so here's what I think is really interesting. And for me, um, crypto has always been about participation. So the way I have learned just throughout my career, through a series of left turns and just being in the right place at the right time, you know, these things are not so intentional. But the way I've learned the most is through actually participating, right? Showing up and participating. And so I was looking at what was happening with NFTs. And obviously, you had CryptoPunks, you had uh, Bored Apes, you had all of these different sort of NFTs that were uh, memes, but they were also sort of identifiers, right? If you have a picture of a punk as your profile picture, that says something about you. What do you mean by eternal September when you're talking about Bitcoin? Yeah, so eternal September um, is an idea from the early days of um, online communities. I forget the name of the specific online community, but basically there was this online community. And you have to remember when people were first getting on the internet in the early 90s, people didn't have computers at home, right? People didn't have internet connectivity at home. And so every September when new people would go to university, right, a bunch of kids now had access to the internet at their university. So every September when a new class came in, all these kids were getting online. They were joining this online forum and the existing community, right, would have to educate all of these newcomers on the norms of their community uh, and sort of uh, help teach them and, and fold them into the way of, of being, into the culture. What happened, um, AOL, right, launched and AOL added uh, the join link for the specific online community to the AOL homepage. Millions of people across America had AOL and all these flooded this online community. And so as a result of all of these new people coming online, the old ways and this community's standards of operating changed entirely because they were just inundated and flooded by this wave of newcomers. And so this entirely new online culture was created in the process of this eternal September because the existing community couldn't integrate and sort of adapt, you know, this this whole new so wave a, of people. It's, it's a net influx, a net fl flux of immigration into a into, a online into an community, online community, essentially. Exactly. And we've seen the same thing nation, with Bitcoin, right? When nation I... states, you, you bring exactly, in a lot of new people right? into, a, into a nation, the culture of the nation changes. It changes entirely. The social norms change, uh, the philosophies change, the popular narratives change. I think we've seen the same thing with Bitcoin. You know, I think a lot of people who are just getting into Bitcoin now, you know, they don't recall, you know, the era from 2013 to 2016-ish the block size wars that started in 2015. I mean, my defining Bitcoin experiences were like sitting at consensus in 2017. We had Roger Ver and Jihan Wu in one side of the room. We had the Blockstream team and a bunch of the Bitcoin core devs on the other side. Like me and Eric Lombroso were in the middle trying to facilitate a peaceful discussion. But like that was the thing that was going on. Um, and we sort of have gone through this interesting time in Bitcoin where I think we've lived through kind of the dark ages of the Inquisition with the laser eye maxis and this whole culture of intolerance that emerged where people were very unaccepting, very critical of anything that was, you know, not this Bitcoin kind of Puritan view, which I think is absolutely fine. But now we've gone through this. Prism. All right. Hold on. Okay. Thanks, see. Dude, not my dog, as I said. Okay. Um, sorry. So we went through this cultural schism. 
And uh, now I think we're seeing a new sort of culture emerge around Bitcoin, which I would like to call the Enlightenment. We're seeing the renaissance with the emergence of ordinals and BRC20 tokens and new L2s, side chains, drive chains, and all of this innovation that I am optimistic will sort of bloom on top of Bitcoin, introduce a bunch of new cases, including, by the way, the casino. Like the casino is the place where people want to go on the internet. And so, um, a bunch of people are very skeptical, you know, because building a casino on Bitcoin is the antithetical to sort of these very <laughs> core ideals. But again, the really cool thing about open permissionless um, networks is that nobody can dictate why, how they should be used. At the end of the day, right, as you and I know, the market dictates what it wants. And if there are people who are willing to pay transaction fees, which they are, transaction fees in Bitcoin have nearly doubled. We've seen over 10 million inscriptions um, as ordinals on Bitcoin network, which has driven a ton of transaction fees, uh, mining fees, but also, by the way, has led to the activation of Taproot, which is a fundamental upgrade to Bitcoin protocol. So I think, you know, people are very dismissive of this idea that things are used in a way that they don't like. But at the end of the day, the market dictates, right? And so I do think there's this very interesting sort of community aspect where you can try to coerce and control. But there's just this massive tide. And as people rush in and there's an influx of newcomers, culture will inevitably change. There is only one constant in the universe, Raul. We're going to nerd out a bit here, right? The laws of thermodynamics. Everything that is possible in our observable universe to date is dictated by the laws of thermodynamics. And the most important law of thermodynamics is the third law, which is all things tend towards entropy which to me, run articulation of that is everything changes, right? Nothing is constant because we are constantly moving between these states of disorder and order, right? Chaos and, and not chaos. And I think the same thing is very true here. Anytime it feels like we reach a stable trajectory in crypto, something goes completely sideways and a whole new wave of chaos emerges. We see it all over the world. We see it in markets, by the way, like stocks are almost as volatile as crypto now. Treasuries, by the way, are Super volatile, which like if you would have told me, I used to trade overnights, right? I used to trade overnights, overnight repo rates. They're like 15 basis points. Overnight repo rates are now volatile. Like, well, how is there vol in markets that have historically represented the risk free rate? So I think it's just an incredibly interesting chapter where this rate of change and just the level of chaos in these systems is just insane. And we have to adapt to that. I'm and I think also um, love some the aspect- Bitcoin side. As Elon says, the, mu- the most amusing outcome is the most probable outcome as well. So the yeah. hardcore, as you said, the, the Spanish Inquisition of crypto have now got people dancing dressed as wizards, and it's hilarious. And of course that was going to happen because that's the best outcome. But again, like there's also this element of, you know, in a world where everything feels so serious, and so heavy, and there's so much fear we need a bit of levity and a bit of joy like we're supposed to be having fun like this is magical internet money um and there is there are elements to that are extremely serious but i think people forget like human beings like levity and and joy is an important part of the experience of being alive so you can't just operate on this very serious side all the time and i tried that and it wasn't really very fun and so for me the crypto dick was like it's fun it's entertaining but I'm learning in real time how you build online communities. Um, I have anointed myself the unofficial high priestess of each island, which is the ancestral home of, of Crypto Dick Buds. For a while, I was doing these things called Sunday service, where we would like do sermons. And I was experimenting with lore and storytelling and different ways of building canonical lore within a community. And um, I wrote a liturgy. I recorded it, like I chanted in Latin. I published it on Spotify. So if you go on Spotify, you look up Crypto Dick Butt Liturgy, um, you, you will find that. And through this process, I just learned, A, how difficult it is to build online communities, B, the importance of lore and storytelling and creating sort of canonical truth in, in building online communities. But also, I think um, you learn a lot about incentives, about motivation, um, and you learn how to create a sense of purpose, but also, you know, create spaces where people have, have fun. So we do these little crypto dick butt events. Um, I recently did one in a banya, which is like a place where you go to sweat. You know, the Schwitz is a very quintessential New York experience. So we went to the Fide Eye banya, but it wasn't a normal banya because of course it's a crypto dick butt event. So I wrote and staged and produced 
a 20 minute crypto dick butt opera. I think it's the first NFT ecosystem opera. I hired professional opera singers and uh, did this whole, you know, unhinged sort of operatic performance in a banya, which I think left everyone very confused. <laughs> but these things, like, that, they're fun, they're zany. It's, it's supposed to be a little weird. There's folklore and in I the think... end. You're building folklore by doing <laughs> ridiculous things. People remember it. 100%. But that's how culture is created, Raul, right? That's how culture is created. And at the end of the day, like, we, we cannot sit back and be critics. We have to try new things and create. And in the process of creation, right, there's creation destruction. But in this process of creating, we learn really fundamental truths. And I think as an investor, I have learned a tremendous amount. Um, I have validated some hypotheses and I've been able to reject others. And that has, for me, has been a very important part of my learning process as someone who's still early in her career, right? And uh, I don't really know if I'm any good quite yet, but I'm figuring it out. And hopefully through these experiences, I will become much better at doing what I do, which is creating culture, creating narratives, and then investing in those narratives. So here's where I struggle with, with investing via means is the time value of means or the persistence of the meme, right? So it's really hard. Some can be fleeting. They can be a weekend. And others can be persistent like Bitcoin. <laughs> And All right, Raul, which, which shit coin hurt you? Which meme coin did you trade that hurt you? I have not. Was it turbo? I, I, generally, I generally keep out of the shit coin pool uh, just because okay. I have no edge. Um, I'm just not, yeah. I just can't navigate my way around that world fast enough to be able to do it. But, you know, I watch some of these and I get, I'm just very interested. I just observe them. I keep a very open mind to it all. You know, I'm watching this entire shit show going on about this Ben.eth and all of these other things. I'm wondering whether it's going to go one way or the other. Either everybody's going to end up in prison or something magnificent in, in, in terms of art is happening in front of our eyes. And I have no idea which, but I'm just watching it with yeah. a wry smile. So I think in a way, um, a lot of this is performance art, right? Like it's very elaborate performance art. And by the way, it's not just crypto. Like, do you remember um, what was the company? Nik Nikolai? Nikola? The EV company that was, um, yeah, Nikolai, right? It was, yeah, Nikolai. It reached twenty nine billion dollar market cap. They didn't actually have a a, a product, right? You look <laughs> at um, Green Sale in the UK. You look at uh, Wirecard in Germany, right? Like these stories are so insane, but they happened. It's like this is real life. It's not just crypto. This financial performance art is happening everywhere. It's absolutely insane. Um, I do think, okay, so what you're alluding to, I think, is some memes are very ephemeral in nature, meaning they're very short-lived. You know, it's this very small moment in time. I think one of the interesting things in crypto is when you're allocating capital, right, there are these very ephemeral trends that are short-term driven. And I think those are a game 100% of musical chairs, right? It's just a game of musical chairs. If you get in early and get out at the right time, maybe it works. But nine times out of 10, it's not going to work and you're going to lose all your money. And as you've alluded to, I think one of the important things is like when you're playing a game, you should know what game you're playing and what winning is in that context. So as long as you understand that trading these meme coins or colloquially, as we call them, shit coins, right, is a game of musical chairs and it is fundamentally a zero sum game, fine. But I think for most people who get into crypto, it actually does a lot of harm, right? Because they end up playing this game of musical chairs, not understanding the game and, and they lose. So I agree with you. The question is really what memes have persisted, right? Because what you're saying here is as an investor, where your edge is, is things that have persistence, things that have durability, where you can play out a, a longer time horizon investment thesis. Um, but also, I think, right, just from an infrastructure perspective, like what are you set up to trade? What are you set up to, to track? There's only so much time in a day. I can't even keep up, keep up with the insanity. Like this Ben Dottie draw, I don't even know what it is. Frankly, I don't want to know what it is because <laughs> I just don't have the mental capacity. Like there's so much in my brain. I, I can't do it. Um, so I think some of the the, the sectors, species um, that have been around for a while, obviously infrastructure and sort of this underlying um, financial infrastructure is an important component of that. I do think infrastructure has fundamentally been overinvested in. There's way too many L1s. There's way too many consensus mechanisms. My view, which maybe is the wrong view, is there will only be four or five dominant uh, consensus mechanisms and four or five dominant networks that really have ongoing utilization as reflected by transaction fees or the willingness or propensity for people to pay for block space. 
right? Because again, at some point, there is real capex and opex that has to be spent to make these networks operational. Somewhere there's someone networks with a nothing, chip. These networks do nothing but sell block space. When you break it down to exactly. its component part, do you sell attractive block space or not? And that's going to be the defining process. Exactly. And then for me, the fun part as a former commodities person is this block space is a digital commodity. So how do I build new financial markets around hedging? How do we build new derivatives, right? There's this whole world of financial engineering that now needs to get unlocked to help prioritize, allocate this block space to help companies that use block space as the primary input for what they do, right, to hedge costs and to just, you know, in the same way that people who produce things in the physical world hedge costs through trading of commodities, right? People who produce things in the digital world are going to have to hedge block space, compute, right? And it's not just block space. Um, there are all sorts of compute derivatives that I think will exist in the future, whether that's GPU compute, whether that's, you know, data storage, whether that's in an energy network, uh, battery storage or energy availability, all of these really interesting things that are going to be unlocked as a result. So thesis one is, you know, block space is a valuable commodity. In what networks will block space continue to be valuable and have persistent value? Um, the second thing that I think is sort of interesting and very durable is memes that have long lasting value. So if we look at certain memes, right, and this is again why I think crypto dick books are so interesting. These jokes are funny. They're always funny. They're consistently <laughs> funny. Uh, they're consistently relevant. Same thing with sort of crypto punks. I think crypto punks have sort of crossed this cultural barrier where they now have permanence. The challenge with identifying things that have permanence is very difficult to know early on. So this is an area where maybe you make a few uh, bets and you follow your intuition. I'm a child of the internet, right? So to me, these things feel more intuitive. And there are a lot of people who come from the industry of culture creation who I think are very well attuned to sort of understanding what creates and drives persistent cultural value to these things that are more mimetic in nature. Um, and then I think there are all of these other interesting narratives that are starting to be created. And again, one of the really important things and exciting things, not just about crypto, but about technology in general, is as investors, as people participating in the creation and proliferation of this technology, one of the things we can do that is so important is create new narratives and then invest in those narratives and manifest these narratives into reality from a market perspective. And so I do think there are a lot of investors who are working hard to create these new narratives. And I see your punk in the background, right? And that's what Punk 6529 is doing, which sees the means of production. Um, this is what others are doing, right? I think positioning Bitcoin as magical internet money is a part of that. But I do think that we have this ability to create narratives and then to invest around giving those narratives permanence. Um, and so... It's a difficult game, I think, investing, right? Particularly venture investing. You don't know if you're any good for quite some time because it takes a long time for these species to play out. But I think we've started to see, I certainly think Bitcoin has cemented its place as a core consensus mechanism and a core network. I think Ethereum, uh, same. I think after that, you know, there's, there's still a lot of wait and see. Um, a lot of these networks are very young. They're two, three, four years old. They don't really see consistent utilization or persistent value for that block space. Um, but I think over time, we will start to see that emerge. Yeah, one of the things, so I try and, you know, because I'm not good at VC because everything sounds amazing to me or everything sounds shit. And usually when I think it's amazing, it's shit. And when it's shit, it's amazing, right? So I, I, I steer away from VC. But what I try to think of is the macro use my macro lens where I do have experience and think, okay, so punks for me is, is pretty easy and we'll test this hypothesis in the next cycle is all trophy assets end up trading at a premium in the latter stages of the bull market when people have money and they want to show status, right? It's a simple thing. London real estate goes up, New York real estate goes up at, towards the end of the bull market because everyone's flush with cash. And we see it with Rolex watches. We see it with art. The art market's highly correlated to that same liquidity yeah. cycle. And you know what we also punks. see it with? So we see it with sports teams, right? Like the new trophy item for but billionaires yeah. is owning a sports franchise. And these sports franchises are trading at multiples that are in yeah. insane, right? Um, I was listening to podcasts the other day. They were talking a bit about sports franchise ownership. These franchises trade at multiples that are 
astronomically overinflated, but there are more billionaires and there are sports franchises in the world. And so again, the power of mimesis, the power of wanting what other people have, right? Uh, I think punks are very much like squarely within that thesis of mimesis and our desire for what others have. <laughs> yeah. And I, so, you know, that's why in my NFT collections, I've, I've tried to just buy both culturally interesting stuff where communities I, I enjoy, whether it's Ret Guy, whether it's Crypto Dick Butts, whether it's MFers, that kind of irreverence yeah. I love. And then I've gone for art, but stuff that I like that has, I think, cultural relevance. And then some of these things like um, punks or apes that could last and have value as a status symbol in the future. Because then as the space grows, I think it's, their prices expand in ETH terms, but ETH goes up as well. So it's kind of, that's how I try and mm -hmm. deal with the space because it's too difficult. I just don't have the time to be deep into all of this. And I think the other aspect of this is interesting is the financialization of the NFT space. So one of the things that NFTs have that traditional collectibles don't, right? Baseball cards, uh, Rolexes, art, sports franchises, maybe a little bit more financializable. But I think for a lot of traditional collectibles where there is a physical custody component, right, where you have to physically hold the asset, you have to verify authenticity. Um, the beautiful thing about an on-chain collectible is you can verify authenticity immediately because it's issued from the smart contract, right? That issued that that token originally. So this authentication process sort of goes away because that's innate to the asset being on chain and issued by a smart contract as a token, number one. And number two, you can actually escrow your your asset, right? And utilize it to obtain a loan and to do all these things. So the financialization of culture through NFTs, I think this interesting thesis I wrote a blog post late last year um, called Market Microstructure for NFTs, which sort of alludes to like how cultural markets are emerging. Um, and the financialization of culture is something that has been going on for quite some time. We see it, by the way, with Instagram and Instagram influencers, right? That was sort of like this massive wave of the financialization of culture and influence and, and mimetic value. But I think what we're seeing now is that on hyperspeed, on warp speed, because these digital collectibles, these NFT, NFTs, pardon, are trading on market microstructure that lends itself to incredible liquidity, incredible latency, right? We can trade these things at light speed at the click of a button in all sorts of new and interesting ways. And so um, that for me is sort of the extension of this thesis that I think is my core thesis as I look at crypto. Trade anything with anyone, anywhere, clear how you want margin, how you want, settle how you want. 24-7, 365, all markets on chain. It's very simple. Wow. The way that gets expressed is complex, but that's where we're headed. But the issue is here, and I, I agree, but I fear we're going to recreate the financial system all over again by excess financialization. Right now, the good thing about crypto and the bad thing is the underlying asset is so volatile that leverage is actually the way to the poorhouse pretty quickly. Um, unlike real estate, where you get these periodic cycles where leverage gets washed, crypto washes leverage really fast because it's the underlying is a 70 vol asset, which is pretty hard to, to borrow against unless you're quite cautious. And every time everybody gets over their ski tips, everybody blows up. But if we are going to financialize the industry, do we think at core blockchain makes it more stable? because we know who owns what. That was my core thesis, but I don't know if it stands or not anymore. What, what, how do you think about this? Yeah. Are we building something better or are we just fucking it up all over again? Well, I go back to um, there is truly nothing new under the sun, which is from you know Ecclesiastes, the book of the Bible, Ecclesiastes, and that is what, like 2,000 years old at this point. So you know there truly is nothing new under the sun. Um, I do think what we're experimenting with, what we're playing at um, is interesting, feels new and novel. But I think, again, um, we are inevitably going to repeat the same things. We've already done it once with sort of the centralized credit flow <laughs> we saw. And again, I think some people look at that and are dismayed. I think um, one of the things I have, have learned, and maybe this is part of, you know, my maturing as an investor is... Um, you know, to not view it through a skeptical or sort of dismayed lens, but to view it just as, you know, human psychology is 
it's pretty consistent, right? <laughs> if we look at um, even governance, right, these narratives around on-chain governance and on-chain voting and all this like shit, human governance sucks. It has sucked for 3,000 years. And Polybius, right, 3,000 years ago wrote about human governance. And everything that was written 3,000 years ago is still relevant today. We have basically completed one loop loop around the kyclos cycle, right, or anacyclosis, where, like, there are just these fundamental patterns for how humans govern themselves. And we're now about to do another lap. We have new technology, new tools, we have new narratives, but it's the same thing because at the end of the day, like, human psychology is the same. And so, again, um, I get excited about it, but I also recognize that there are only so many business models, right? And I think one of the things that happens in crypto with investors is we like to spend disbelief and believe that somehow there are these like incredible new business models being created. No. At the end of the day, for business to have persistence and longevity, there are three fundamental truths. The three fundamental truths are cash flow, income statement, balance sheet. And so I look at some of these things and I'm like, this sounds great. It sounds very sexy. It sounds very cool. How do you make money? how do you continue to produce more profit than you consume in cost, right? Whether you're a protocol, whether you're a community, whether you're an ecosystem or a company, I don't care, right? At the end of the day, there is a chip somewhere in a machine plugged into a power source and there are human being machines. There are entities that are performing work that needs to be paid. So how are you going to pay those bills in a consistent and sustainable manner? That is really the question when we're having the block space discussion, right? And this discussion around the value of block space, that's really a discussion we're having is, is there enough value that is being created here that there's someone willing to pay more than it takes to operate and maintain these systems, these companies, whatever they may be. And so um, I think you sort of have to keep this balance and it's hard because in some ways you have to suspend this belief and you have to invest in these zany, wacky things. But at the same time, at some point somewhere, there does have to be a sustainable, scalable model and I think one of the things we are relearning is not everything scales infinitely, right? I think we have this view in technology sometimes that like everything needs to be globe scale and address the needs of all 8 billion, 9 billion people on planet Earth and, you know, God knows whatever sentient entities are out there in our broader universe. Uh, not everything scales well and not everything scales infinitely. It doesn't mean it can't be incredibly profitable, right? As we've seen with, with NFTs and luxury software, if you will. And I think a lot of crypto in many ways is luxury software. Um, but I, I do think, you know, at the end of the day, what I come back to is there is nothing new under the sun. The fundamentals that I learned about in undergrad and business school, working in industry, um, those haven't changed. The fundamentals we learned about with commodities, right, the laws of supply and demand, these haven't fundamentally changed. No, and I've always there's, said that. They're as persistent as the laws of thermodynamics, right? Like there are these global yeah. truths, there are these universal truths. And um, whether it's today or tomorrow, at some point, they will come back for us all. And so I just, Try to keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, my view in all of this is humans love two things above more above all others. One is sex, and the other is leverage, and they just can't help themselves. <laughs> and it basically drives so everything. When, so when are we going into the porn business? If that's well, that's going to happen, right? We know that. I think this that we're already seeing some of the porn sites experimenting with NFTs, but just wait to this AI construction. It's a complete change because everybody can have their own self-designed pornography that's instantaneous it's yeah. like it's a crazy world we're going into right but it's nothing new under the sun right no. like it's a new media <laughs> but it, it's the same and so um again i find it interesting i find it exciting i do think that um there are a lot of narratives here that are really interesting to untangle to sort of play with to rotate look at from different angles um but i do think you know having a solid head on your shoulders. I have gotten caught up in the hype. I've done things in bull markets that I would not do today. This is the process of learning, or maybe that is my inner degenerate. Uh, fortunately, I do that with my own capital, not, not investor capital. Um, but I, and it's part of the learning process, I think. But I, at the end of the day, as the industry matures, as the technology becomes more integrated into our global systems into our way of thinking into sort of the social political cultural narrative i do think there is a maturing that happens it is an evolution and i think there are some fundamental questions right about you know 
ultimately, does this technology create more degrees of freedom? I think one of the ways that blockchains and cryptocurrencies consistently get positioned is these are tools that give humans more degrees of freedom, whether that's freedom in financial transactions, freedom in terms of how information is transmitted, stored. Um, do we gain more degrees of freedom through this technology? Or in fact, does this technology remove degrees of freedom from our human experience? And I think we see that as well with the discussion around central bank digital currencies, with the increase of on-chain surveillance, with the increase of sort of permission services um, that are presented as permissionless services, but in fact have kill switches or ways for people to be exempt or uh, unable from using the system. Um, so censorship, right, at a fundamental level that is contractually sort of embedded into, into this financial infrastructure that we're positioning as this tool for freedom is in fact like a tool for very dystopian, totalitarian, monetary and fiscal and, and control, right? So there is this fundamental question of, are we enabling more degrees of freedom, which is something I'm personally excited by, is how do we give people more freedom um, in, in whatever you know, way you want to position that, or are we removing degrees of freedom? And I think that's really where the balance comes in. If we look at the technology that's being funded today in Silicon Valley, defense technology, internet technology, um, you know, a lot of the new software, it's removing degrees of freedom. And so I do think there is this fundamental battle for the soul of the internet that is currently taking place. If we look at Section 230, the Earn It Bill, um, even the battle for encryption, you know, we're on Crypto Wars, Iteration 2.0, 3.0, 4.0. And it, you know, it's it's been 20 years since the original Crypto Wars, but we're still having the same conversations under the guise of safety, right? And so um, there's just a lot of things, I think, that are happening, that are unfolding. This battle for the soul of the internet is unfolding. And um, I think crypto is one of the the harbingers of that. This industry has the capital, the resources, and the cultural zeitgeist, the cultural narrative to help fight that battle. But I do think over the next five, 10 years, um, that battle is going to accelerate and it's going to be very important to dictating what direction this, this takes. Are we creating more degrees of freedom or are we removing degrees of freedom? I know what side I'm on, uh, I think, right? Um, and what I'd like to support and how I'd like to direct capital. But I think it's incumbent on everyone in the industry and outside the industry to sort of help sort of uh, shape and dictate that narrative arc and to push in that direction. I mean, that's another age-old human state is the control of the people versus the power of the people, right? That's an endless flux, an ebb and a flow that never, there's no final state that never is. But it does feel like as we've been given a new playground to battle with, that that battle is going to play out over the next decades. It's not, you know, can we get some governments to use Bitcoin in their reserves? It's nothing to do with that. It's a much broader thing. And I think 6529 is, you know, very much at the front of that thinking is like, this is an important battle to take. And we all take our play our role in it, how we play those roles in what part of it, that's fine. You know, some people have chosen to be maximalists. They're the gladiators at the front. The others have decided to be the court jesters to try and change different things. You know, everyone's playing a role that they perceive within this thing. Sure. <laughs> and that's good because the, there is no one truth here. And that's one thing I've learned in life. There is no truth. It is a shared collection of truths. And the more people who share that collection of truth, the more likely you are to create a broader meme that carries the power of the people together. Well, and if I could sum up my experience over the last eight years in this industry in one way, it would be precisely that. I think you start to learn that reality as we experience it, right, is not this emergent thing. It's something that's created through memes, through markets, um, and memes and markets drive, drive the world. And memes and markets are dictated by human desire. And human desire is a very complex thing, but also a very simple thing. And so if we look at what we did with Bitcoin, and this is always so fascinating to me, we memed a global reserve currency into existence. Over the last decade, we have memed a global reserve currency, a digital nation state in the form of Bitcoin into existence. Whether you agree with that, not that is the reality, right? If we look at where Bitcoin sits today, that's wild. And we didn't all agree on everything. We didn't all agree on everything. It wasn't us singing kumbaya and all holding hands. There was a lot of internal strife in that. But that reality has now sort of been created. There are now these new realities we're working to create. We're not all going to fundamentally agree on all of the details. But if we can agree on the direction 
and we can agree on the vision, right? Um, that starts to get really interesting. I do think, again, if we go back to this crisis of meaning, if we look at all of the narratives, right, there is nothing inspiring or hopeful in the current discourse that is happening in politics. It's all doom, gloom, sadness, austerity, sucks, right? As someone who's in her 30s, I'm not inspired. It's very bleak. Crypto offers, I think, and just technology generally, uh, offers a more hopeful, optimistic future, hopeful, optimistic vision. Whether you agree with Elon Musk or, or not, regardless of what you think of him, I think he's done an exceptional job creating a compelling and optimistic vision with this idea of humanity becoming interplanetary. Again, think what you will. Everyone has their own opinions. But the man's ability to create a new, optimistic, and hopeful narrative has inspired a lot of people, right? It has also caused his companies to trade like meme stocks at incredible valuations that far exceed the economic reality of the underlying business. And so through the power of memes and through the power of narrative, Elon Musk has effectively memed himself into being the world's richest man. If you look at Henry Arnault, right, what does he say about the LVMH business, which again, you know, LVMH is an incredible business. Arno, you know, I think is, you know, neck and neck with Elon at, to, for World's Richest Man. He sells hopes and dreams. He sells people desire. When someone buys, you know, a luxury handbag, it's not because they're buying it for the utility or the form. They're buying it because of mimetic desire. And so, you know, this business of selling hopes and dreams, that's what markets are predicated on. <laughs> and so to me, what's been really incredible is just taking a step back and understanding, you know, we we can get very technical and get very much into the nuts and bolts of investing. There's the technical analysis crowd. There's the fundamentals crowd. Um, you know, there's the value investing crowd. There are all these very technical and rational ways to view investing. And I think when you look at investing in something like cryptocurrency or technology, you sometimes have to take a step back from the fundamentals and go into this world of the metaphysical and the philosophical to really, truly understand what is driving the shift. And for me, that's been the really fun part of the journey. I started, you know, very much in the world of spreadsheets and the fundamentals and the technicals of how businesses operate. And over time, I've had to lean into the right and left side of the bell curve and really start to understand what drives belief, what humans are motivated by, how new realities are created. Um, and that's, I think, where the fun is. If you can bring the technical rigor and the technical understanding and the intellectual horsepower, right, the fundamentals. But couple that with the philosophical sort of more esoteric understanding of how we create meaning and how we create reality. I think those two together are really potent um, and I think can be really interesting uh, as an investor. You know, it's sort of this new frontier is emerging and uh, it's very fun. So I'm very appreciative that I get to do that on a day to day basis because I get to have very weird esoteric conversations, but at the same time also grill people on their balance sheet, which is very important. <laughs> well, I think, you know, you are one of the people who have defined themselves now from being at the, either the far left or the far right of the bell curve. And I think that's great. And it was interesting. I had a, um, a global macro event in, in Mallorca a couple of weeks ago. And I, I showed that meme and said, listen, guys, everybody needs to, because there's so much arguing over that middle ground with the well, actually kind of crowd. And I'm like, you got to get out of this. And the problem was, is people just looked at me and said, I don't know if I'm in the middle or I think I'm on the right, but I, I think I might be in the middle now. <laughs> really hard to suspend beliefs in a way or know it so well that you can distill it all down to a very simple thing. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an art form that you've managed to do. And I think you've been amazing in this journey. And you know, thank you for all you do and all thank you share. You. And you've taken a lot of people along with you for the ride to understand that, yes, you might be the crazy mean woman, but you're actually far from crazy. <laughs> well, look, I'm having fun doing it. Um, it. It's always great to be on with you, Raul. And I appreciate that you've created this, this forum for discussion here on Real Vision, you know, where the crazy dick butt lady. <laughs> I used to be the crazy Bitcoin lady, not the crazy dick butt lady. I'll take it. Um, but I do think it's important to have these discussions. And again, at the end of the day, right, as investors, here's the beautiful thing. There is a scorecard and it's called right. performance. And again, um, with venture, the time scale is a bit longer, but at the end of the day, right, performance, sort of where you are and, and 
are you able to spot trends before they happen? That is a, a very interesting thing to try to be good at. Um, and we're going to see if I'm any good or not. I've been very wrong many times and I've been right a few times. And hopefully those few times that I'm right will generate enough alpha that they offset the many, many times that I've been wrong. And it requires humility. I get punched in the face every day by my own stupidity. And that's good. So you learn through that process. Um, and so I think, you know, the market humbles us all. I've been humbled many times. But the few times that I've been right and had conviction, I think, have, have really been exceptionally right. And so I'm looking forward to seeing how I evolve as I go on this journey. If I'm in the middle, you know, we're going to know very quickly. But I'm going to try not to mid-curve it. But it's the everyday process. It's hard. <laughs> and as you said, whatever we think today is, is not what tomorrow is going to be or a year's time. So whatever our thesis is are now, they're not persistent. Well, some, you might have yep. persistent threads, but everything will change. And that's half of the fun of this. It's an ever evolving yep. puzzle of which we get to solve it, it at lightning speed as well. So it's a lot of fun to do. It's a lot of fun. It's, it's a bit stressful sometimes. Um, and I think intellectual, intellectually humbling and uh, you really have to remove your ego from it. Uh, people have a lot of opinions as well, you know. I love the opinion, uh, different opinions. Great. But look, I think this is the way the world is headed. Um, it's just, it's only going to continue. And again, you can have a thesis. I think the thesis fundamentally has not changed. I think the expression of the thesis and where the market is moving and how you generate investment returns on that thesis changes, right? And so it's really understanding in this current moment, what is the expression of this thesis that is going to generate return, right? That, that is my function is to generate return. And so it's what is the expression of this thesis that generates return? And how does that evolve over time? And I think being cognizant of that is also has been a learning for, for me. Fabulous. Melton, as ever, a fantastic conversation. It's been too long and I really, really enjoyed it. Not the, the interview wasn't, the conversation wasn't too long. It's too long since I spoke <laughs> to you properly. I know. Well, uh, I am happy you have joined my cult of crypto dick butts because you have a crypto dick butt now, right? I do. Okay. I'm very proud of you. So we are in many cults together. We're in the Bitcoin cult together. We're in the crypto dick butt cults. I'm sure we will join and maybe start more. You've started your own, you know, cults of belief <laughs> with, with real vision. Um, and this is part <laughs> of the fun, but always such a pleasure speaking with you. Such a pleasure being with your audience um, who have a lot of opinions and love sharing them, which I appreciate. Um, and looking forward to hopefully, you know, starting many new cults and joining them. And let's all get weird with it. And have some fun. <laughs> all right, my friend, great Thank to see you. you uh, and Thank I'll see you, you soon. So as ever, Meltem is both highly engaging, can explain things really well, but she really does live outside the mid curve. And She's somebody who really inspires me in how she thinks, gets you to think differently about things. And I think her perspectives, her pragmatism, but yet wide-eyed optimism and suspension of belief system is something that is really, really useful. And she doesn't err on the side of hubris either. She errs on the side of the kind of realism of what it is. And I think human behavior is the big driver of all of this. In fact, it's the driver of everything. And memetics lie at the very center of it. That's how humans organize after all. Anyway. Fantastic discussion and uh, can't wait to get it back. Hey, visionaries. Thank you for tuning in. For more free crypto content like this, head over to realvision.com forward slash crypto. You'll get early access to the most brilliant minds in the space to cut through the noise, get in-depth analysis and get you ahead of the curve with unbiased insights.